Hello and welcome to the Friday edition of News Today. Coming up live from our studios here at Kokumlimle in Accra, I am Benis Abu Bedu. Have you ever imagined a school without teachers? We'll bring you a report by our citizen journalist. Also, the Progressive People's Party calls on the Peace Council and GBA to call the EC to order. We'll tell you why. And a legal practitioner John Indabugri predicts that the court will throw out legal suits challenging disqualification of the 12 presidential candidates. We'll hear his reasons. We have business, sports and international news in the next hour. Please stay with us. Many thanks for your company. In our very first story, the Judicial Services Staff Association of Ghana has threatened to withdraw its services from October 22, 2016 if government fails to pay up its consolidated salaries. The association says President John Mahama has since June 2015 not appended his signature to the, for the release of funds needed to cover allowances for clothing, rent and some of the needs of the staff. President of the group, Alex Nate, tells Joe News all attempts to get government to fulfill its part of the promise has yielded no result, a reason the association has taken this decision. When it, you are looking at issues that pertain to conditions of service for judicial service staff, the parameters are clear. Judicial Council has the duty of engaging the staff to determine appropriate conditions for the service. Um, after determination, they forward it to the president for approval and implementation. The Judicial Council, as far back as June 2015, finished its work and made recommendations to the president and submitted it. We have since June 2015, no had uh, response from government as to what they make of the recommendations that the Judicial Council uh, submitted. You will recall, as you rightly indicated, uh, in May there was a protest because uh, that was exactly one year when the thing had been submitted without any response. And interventions were made. We took them in good faith. We yielded, thinking that uh, before long, government would have done what is expected. We have done everything. We even reluctantly had to appear before a presidential committee. Uh, the committee uh, concluded its work, submitted them to the president, and we still haven't heard anything. Uh, we subsequently engaged with the Chief of Staff, the Labor Minister, the Attorney General, and the management of the Judicial Service. With no results, we think that um, the issue has taken on due, on duly too long. And Mr. Nate, you truly think that a strike or an industrial action is what will solve this problem? What do you think will solve it? After we had used every a uh, reasonable uh, legal means to engage. You can find out from the Labour Minister, you can find out from Graham. We have been the most diplomatic uh, Labour front as far as these issues are concerned. And uh, all these things have been yielded uh, the, the, the expected results. So what do you think in Ghana is the option uh, to work it. So while JUSAG is threatening strike, the Government and Hospital Pharmacist Association, GOSPA, has suspended its nationwide strike. The pharmacists have been protesting for the last four months over the government's failure to address discrepancies in their market premium payment. The decision to call off the strike action follows an emergency delegates meeting. Raymond Tete, a former chairman of GOSPA, spoke earlier on John News Desk. 
Let was some agreements at a general meeting by delegates representing uh, pharmacies nationwide. Has government met your uh, your request? Well, we had a series of meetings with the Minister for Labour, and an MOU was signed to that effect that uh, our issues be considered. So what happens next? Before that, did government tell you which, or did the a MOU uh, tell you when your demands would be met? Yes, they said uh, somewhere in January next year. We should look towards something like that. Uh, but uh, of course, that is not the best. But uh, we are also uh, aware that uh, our patients uh, need our services. So let me find out from you, Mr. Tessa, was it a compromise decision because you were talking about discrepancies in your you know, market premium. What exactly was agreed uh, in the uh, uh, MOU? Well, as part of the negotiation process, we were informed that uh, if we remain on strike, then it would be difficult for the engagement process to continue. So we needed to show good faith. Apart from that, the National Labor Commission also took the matter to court, and we were sermon. And we've had two sessions already. We have also filed in opposition to their request for us to return to work. We are saying that we have to implement or enforce the implementation of their ruling. And we know that three major things you, you talked about before you embarked on the strike was condition, there were conditions of service, you talked about interim market premium as well as the structure. Would you say that you're satisfied with each of these according to the MOU you signed? Well, the MOU has taken on board the issue of the grid structure and they've affirmed that it will be implemented and we are looking forward to that. With regards to the interim market premium, government says it is now implementing uh, from January market premium. There's no more interim. And so we'll be invited to negotiate that one. And we think that uh, uh, it will be difficult for our members. I mean, having to give away so much back pay. But then we are looking forward to an agreement on that. Now, as concerns the conditions of service, uh, there's an ongoing engagement with the fair wages. Uh, likely, we will start that uh, Monday to resolve the outstanding issue. We are almost done on that. So we think uh, generally uh, there are other aspects that we are not comfortable with, and we'll take them on as they come. Now, customers of the defunct microfinance company Diamond Winners are on the streets of Jarapa in the Upper West region to demand payment of their monies. Their investments have been locked as a result of the company's failure to meet certain requirements indicated by the Bank of Ghana. Rafiq Salam is with the customers and joins us live on the telephone with more. Hello, Rafiq, and thanks for your time. Where exactly are you now? Hello. Hi, Rafiq. Hello. Hello, Rafiq. If you can hear me, can you tell us exactly where you are now and uh, what the intention of these uh, customers are? Um, uh, we are currently at Jirapa, and then I can tell you that uh, the victims or uh, customers of the, the fund company are now heading around the street as uh, Jirapa. Uh, they have pulled out their frustration uh, about what is really happening to them. They told us that uh, since much last year, they have not gotten their money that they have deposited with this uh, defunct uh, microfinance company known as Diamond are Winners. And I can tell you that the office that they were written has not been turned into a shop bar or a drinking bar. And so they are really frustrated about the situation. And even some of the people that spoke to us uh, talk about uh, uh, the need uh, to get their money so that uh, they will uh, be at peace uh, with themselves so that they can vote in the December poll. Well, you've told us what their intentions are, but who will they be presenting uh, this document to? Um, they presented, uh, what they did was that they, they first got it at the uh, Jepa market, uh, from there they still uh, all stood at uh, Jepa before uh, they went to the Jepa district assembly to present a petition uh, to the district coordinating director, uh, Derek Kripp, 
Uh, but when uh, we visited the Jepa uh, uh, Assembly, the uh, the GP, uh, was not around, but he was uh, uh, they met the district coordinator director, the first woman, uh, a woman Sanya uh, Samani. Uh, he was there and then they presented to him. And so he took the position on behalf of the Honorable Chief Chief and he told them that uh, their witnesses will be granted and that they will, will go to finish through the document and then uh, act with it with all the, uh, uh, with all the, uh, 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 with the, the purpose for which it was done. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rafiq Salam. He's bringing us some updates all the way from the Upper West Region, where some customers of the defunct DKM are protesting uh, and actually on a demonstration. We'll bring you more updates later. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll bring you some more stories. Please don't go away. This is your election headquarters. Let's do some election-related news now. The Progressive People's Party has called on the National Peace Council, the Chief Imam, the Ghanaba Association, and uh, some other civil organizations to call the EC to order. Addressing a news conference, PPP policy advisor Kofi Samoa Sion accused the EC of committing similar administrative errors for which the commission uh, disqualified the party's presidential candidate. The policy advisor further stated that the commission was being being selective in application of electoral laws, a situation the party describes as discriminatory. Michael Leave, Joseph Akablay was at that press conference and joins me in the studio with more on this. You're welcome, Joseph. Uh, but okay. before we go into the details of the press conference, the PPP earlier threatened to file a suit in court today. Were they able to do that? Um, that suit has not been filed in court and in fact the point that the policy advisor who addressed the press conference was making is that a decision to result to a court action will be one that will be taken by the party's presidential candidate. Now what they are doing now is just to call on such bodies to call the EC to order. So is this uh, uh, so that if they're not be, uh, if they're not able to get their results through this means, then they will go to court? Is that Exactly. And they are, the point they are, or the reason why they are asking that this body should call the EC to order is the fact that they have the view that the EC is out of order. Mm. Reason being that they went further to state instances where they have the opinion that the EC has either acted contrary to the laws of the country or the EC's own electoral laws or in some cases committed electoral or administrative um, errors just like the EC accused mm. them of committing. So did they give any examples? Uh, they talked about the receipts that we, they were given and when they made a deposit to the commission. I'm talking mm. about the payment for all the 170 parliamentary candidates. Mm. They are saying that the receipt that was written was error written. The figure that was stated didn't match up with the amount in words that was also put out on that same receipt. Mm. Then again, they also talk about the fact that some months earlier, the Electoral Commission's Director of Operations, uh, Mr. Amadou Sile, stated that parties that fail to comply with the Political Parties Act will have their alliances withdrawn. And in that case, they are talking specifically with emphasis on uh, the fact that parties need to submit their audited accounts. And they are saying that they have evidence to the effect that some other parties have not been able to comply, but still they have the alliances and will be contesting in this year's polls. They mentioned the NPP flag by Ananado Dankwa Akufuado, who they make the point again that um, he stated when he went, went to the Electoral Commission Service to submit his nomination form that he wouldn't be complying with the declaration of assets because he feels that it's not within the law. Now they make the point again that even though in the nomination form you are supposed to attach an oath from the commission, you swear the commission of oath. And in that oath, he stated that you'll be declaring his um, assets. He didn't do that. So they have the view that the same commission that says if you don't do that, you'll be disqualified. Why is the commission being selective in such a case? Mm. And uh, so what are some of the other issues they raised uh, while addressing the press? Uh, so then again, they went further to talk about the fact that the nomination form that the Electoral Commission gave to the parties presidential candidate Dr. Pakwisindum, it didn't have page 46 and they say page 46 was for a district. They said that wasn't in there. So they are not very happy about the way the EC has conducted itself and they maintain that they are, the fight continues. In fact, they are not backing down. They are confident they are still in the race and that is why they are calling on these bodies to first and foremost call the EC to order and once the EC doesn't do that, uh, they will go ahead and maybe consider taking a court action as mm. the only means of ensuring that their party's parliamentary candidate, their presidential candidate, is also on uh, the electoral roll as well. Mm. So you can hear policy advisor Kofi Asamasia. We wish to put on record 
that the receipt the EC gave the PPP on 10th October 2016 was fraught with mistakes, major mistakes. Could you imagine that the amount the EC quoted in words is different from what was quoted in figures? Did you know that the EC gave us the, the receipt for the payment or the receipt that it gave us had this 1,700 Ghana cities in figures and in words, they wrote 1,700,000, I don't know what that means. Apart from this, on the same receipt, the EC wrote, being payment of parliamentary candidate, parliamentary emphasis on parliamentary candidate filing fee, as if payment was made for only one parliamentary candidate. Clearly, we have every reason to believe that the EC had set itself on a course for a possible fraudulent act, and we have therefore written to the Auditor General and the Economic and Organized Crime Office to investigate this matter and prosecute the perpetrators if deemed necessary. Does this not mean that it is possible for everyone to make administrative errors if this is true, why does the EC want to work together with political parties with iron fist? Why is the EC adamant on eighth position and is not ready to open up for discussion? The EC gave us nomination forms to complete. It is intriguing the EC wants to be seen as an institution incapable of mistakes and committing errors, yet they are not immune from administrative errors, and I've just cited one above. We decided to be silent about this issue, but we have been pushed to the world to disclose what happened to our nomination forms. We wish to state that there was no page 46, and that district is a Krapun North district and one other district, in the nomination forms we received from the EC. However, we in the PPP did did not take them to task that the nomination form was illegal and, and doesn't qualify to be received. We called the EC to notify them and they proposed an antidote to this error. If the PPP had engaged, in the, elect, had engaged the Electoral Commission to correct this blunder, why can't the EC reciprocate as demanded by Reg Reg Regulation 9? of CI-94. Our current EC commissioners are vindictive to say the least. This was an unfair treatment and the EC cannot tell us that this was also not a simple mistake. Well, Joseph, so uh, we know that the PPP's presidential candidate, Papakwesi Indum, uh, said that they were going to start parliamentary uh, campaigns today. Do we have any news on that? Uh, in actual fact, the information we are picking is that the parliamentary candidates, 170 of them across the country, have hit the ground running today and they are going out there to campaign with the hope that they also get elected as well. Thank you very much, Joseph, for those updates. Let's still stay on elections because flag bearer of the new patriotic party, Nana Dodankwe Kufuado, says Ghana will record the slowest economic growth in 22 years under President Mahama's watch as president. The third time presidential hopeful says uh, the president's continuous stay in office remains a threat to national security and the economy. He was speaking during his tour of the Anya Sotum constituency in the greater Accra region. There's more in the following report by John Uses Latif Idris. <laughs> for the new patriotic party's campaign has landed in the Anya Soutum constituency and the reception and the response of the people has been massive right from Taboro Junction to Alaji to the University of Pentecost campus the response of the electorate in this constituency has been massive now the flag bearer of the new patriotic party has been addressing the university, the university students I'm talking about the students of the University of Pentecost 
Nana's message is straightforward and simple that the students must think about their future and that President Mahama remains a threat to the development of the state. We can take a listen to what the flag bearer of the new patriotic party had to say to the student body. Every year since John Romani Mahama became president, our economy has shrunk. Every year shrunk. And this year, we are going to have the slowest rate of growth of our economy for 22 years. What it means is that your ability to walk out of here and get a job is being compromised right now. What I'm trying to leave with you is that four more years of John Dramani Mahama will mean that you have no future to go back to. Parliamentary candidate for the New Patriotic Party and the incumbent MP of this constituency, Shelley Ayokobotwe, has also been making references to the issue of unemployment in this country as of now. Uh, she called on the student body to vote massively for the flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party. President Mahama is also on the road, and yesterday he hit back at MPP's vice presidential candidate, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, on his interpretation of the recent Moody's rating of the Ghanaian economy. Dr. Baumia had alleged that the MPP manifesto launched last Sunday that the president misinterpreted Moody's latest rating of the economy, which is now pegged at B3 with a stable outlook. However, speaking to a charged crowd of students at the University of Ghana campus last night, President Mahama said Dr. Baumia got his interpretation wrong. The president commenced his campaign activities for the day at about 2 p.m., stopping first at the Abeka market. President Mahama, in a brief address, urged traders at the market not to engage in violence before, during, and after this year's polls. <laughs> and we just came to visit you. This is not a rally. I'm only greeting you and reminding you that we are voting on 7th December. Seven December. Let's all have a good heart and be peaceful during the polls. The NDC presidential candidate then headed to Malamata Market, where he reiterated his promise to renovate existing markets if given the Nord ones. Yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, we are going to make all markets new. Market. We will renovate each. Yeah, this is because market most market markets are not in good shape and there's yeah, prone to fire yeah. outbreak, which leads to lots yeah, of our yeah. brothers and mothers' worries. Yeah. The president then addressed a mammoth rally at the Kotobabi Park, where he took a swipe at the opposition MPP. President Mahama said, contrary to claims by the opposition MPP, that governments literally put money in the pockets of people, that wasn't the case. Governments, he stated, provide opportunities for people. <laughs> What they often say is that they ask people whether they have money in their pockets. Like I said yesterday, no president will ask citizens to kill, so he distributes money to them. If you get money, you need to work. Like I said yesterday, all governments can do is to provide schools to ensure that people will be equipped with skills to enable them to work and earn money. schools, 
President Mohammed's team had the University of Ghana as the final stop for the day. President Mohammed presented brave versions of the NDC manifesto to some visually impaired students, after which he addressed the team in students. The leader of the governing party decided to reply to Dr. Baumia on claims made by the latter during the NPP's manifesto launch that the president had wrongly interpreted a recent publication by the ratings agency on Ghana. It is the same with the economy. If you create the impression that the economy is in crisis, Ghana is going back despite all the scientific basis, even from outside. Moody's comes and upgrades us and say there's more confidence in Ghana's economy. We've gone from negative to stable. And then somebody who calls himself an economist can stand and say there was no Moody's upgrade. I can't think far, I can't think far. Still on the elections, the Electoral Commission has justified the disqualification of former First Lady Nana Kune Dojeman Rawlins from contesting the December 7 general elections on the ticket of the NDP. Lawyers for Mrs. Rawlins had challenged the basis of her disqualification in a letter threatening legal action if the EC failed to reverse the decision. The Commission responded in equal measure Thursday evening, insisting the disqualification was justified. Here's a news desk report. Lawyers for the Electoral Commission have mounted a strong defense in an 11 page response after lawyers for the NDP flag bearer, Nana Konedwajma Rawlings, challenged their basis for disqualifying the former First Lady. According to the EC, contrary to the position of the NDP lawyers, that the Commission had no power to proceed in the manner they did. By disqualifying the flag bearer, they argue that per the Public Elections Regulations 2016 CI 94, Regulation 9 1, a candidate shall be considered to stand nominated unless proof is given to the satisfaction of the returning officer of the candidate's death, withdrawal or disqualification. Adding that, the rule insists the returning officer shall give the candidate an opportunity to make amendments or any alteration necessary within the stipulated nomination period. However, this they explain is conditional constituting a correlative right enjoyed only within the stipulated nomination period. Failure to make alterations within the stipulated nomination period would render a candidate's nomination invalid, they added. Plus, the CI-94 made no provisions for an extension. According to the layers of the AC, in the specific case of the NDP, they presented their nomination forms a day to the final day for the nomination, although all candidates were aired to submit their nominations as early as possible. The Commission thus was unable to accept Mrs. Rawlings' nomination as the number of subscribers to a form did not meet the requirements of Regulations 2B of CI 94. Let's spend some more time on election-related news. Legal practitioner John in the Bougarie says the 12 disqualified presidential candidates have demonstrated a wrong understanding of the law when they argue that the Electoral Commission used mere cleric errors as a basis to reject their nomination papers. The former MP on the ticket of the PNC explains the EC disqualified the 12 based on serious violations of the law and not simple clerical errors as they claim. He spoke earlier on Joy FM's Super Morning Show. No law which says that the person who has, been, has done multiple registration should be convicted before he is disqualified from, from ABC. This is uh, pointing to Section 9 of uh, CI 94. It doesn't say that you must be prosecuted the person before he is disqualified. But if a person is not prosecuted, how then do you convict the person? Uh, the Electoral uh, Commission has a database. So they know those who have done multiple registration. Yeah, what do you make of the provision in the same CI 94 that says the EC, uh, you know, has the responsibility to give uh, the party involved or the affected party uh, an opportunity to rectify uh, any anomaly found in the nomination form? No, I, again, I think that is a complete misinterpretation of the law. I understand that portion to be dealing with what you started the interview with. Clerical errors. Your name is wrongly spelled. Maybe 
you have uh, quoted your telephone number wrongly and so on and so forth not when you have done something in violation of the law you cannot be called to come and correct a violation of the law the, the, the institutions are not allowed to to to, to aid people to violate uh, a statute and i'm saying that it is not one of the instances that you have violated a section of the law, therefore it becomes necessary for you to be called to come and correct it. It will refer to very simple clerical errors. And these things must be done within the nomination period. Uh, do you feel that the litany of challenges and the potential court cases could derail the timetable for our uh, elections? Well, I'm not, I'm not a judge, but you see, just like in the first Indum case, some of us opine that the, the court will throw out the application because the courts are sitting there to do substantial justice and not to, you know, engage in frivolous things. So I don't see that there any court action will pass must just based on this technical interpretation of the, the, the law. So they may go and they will be thrown out.